Good morning. Good morning. Hello. I'm Zena. Hi, Hi Zena. I'm Nice to meet you, Paul and Christy. Christy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet nice you to as meet well. You. Yes, where are you guys? Where are you guys located? Um, I'm in Dubai. You're in Dubai. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Cristiano. Invited me, said I should say hi. So once I got the time zone right, <laughs> I thought I could just about stay up. It's midnight now, so I thought. I'll pop in and say hello yeah. and see what you guys chat about and see if I can learn oh, anything. Yeah, something. Great. Great. So glad to have you. And Christine, where are you? Um, I'm down in Southern California. Okay. So great. Great area. Mm -hmm. great. What about you? Are you guys up in the Bay? So we have a little interesting story. Yes, the studio Synergy is in... San Rafael, California, so near San Francisco. I am currently in uh, Ticino in Switzerland. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so we have our, we're starting our little sister studio here in Switzerland, in Europe. Oh, and nice. so, and then Genevieve, who's there, um, who's just logging in, is in San Rafael as well. At this, She's actually in the studio in San Rafael. So, yes. We have, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about our group. I think we have a few more people who are going to sign in in just a minute. And so I'll tell you about uh, kind of what we do. Basically, we bring to light any um, difficult cases, case study pre presentation. Anybody welcome to share their own. Um, I always have a little theme going on each week. Um, this week, my theme has been um, the, how the scapula is connected to the rib cage and making that connection in the body. So that's been the theme of this week uh, for me and my clients. And I kind of carry that through my group classes. So a lot of times we'll, if nobody has case studies to share, we've been sharing about thoughts and ideas on, on a specific topic. So just as a suggested topic. Um, so... I don't know if you guys wanted to share. And then the other thing that I was bringing to light recently is a discussion about spondylolisthesis and how you handle clients who have spondylolisthesis. Kind of what are the contraindications? What are the what are we going to work on? What are great things to work on with somebody like that? So I always try to open the floor and ask if anybody has any difficult cases, case studies, or needs help with anything, or wants to talk through anything that they have, that they've seen, that they have going on with a client. So I'll just open the floor, if you guys have any of that that you wanted to bring to the floor. For me, for me I, um, I have one very difficult client. Uh, she's more of a neuro client, though. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know if you guys get into any neurology discussions or anything like that, but I'd love to hear people's takes on oh. neurology stuff. So, please shoot, shoot, give us a give us a little background. And okay, okay. So she is um, mid forties. Um, she has. Uh, uh, quite a bit of deformities uh, throughout her body. So when she was born, she had cancer and it was in her bladder and they had to radiate. Um, so basically all the pelvic floor structure is not intact like most people. Um, she doesn't have a bladder. So, and she doesn't have, a, you know, a, a, oh my God, I can't even think of the names sorry, um, a uterus. <laughs> That's what I was trying to think of. So, um, you know, things are difficult for her to try and connect um, with her body just in general. Um, she also has uh, one foot is clubbed and another foot, there's no range in the, in the ankle, no dorsiflexion. So it's kind of fused in that way. Um, she has a pretty severe limp um, on her right side. 
And it seems like most of everything that I'm seeing on her seems to be coming from her right side. So I'm trying to work on getting her to engage that right side a little bit more um, and maybe not work or worry about so much about symmetry or the thought of having to be, you know, working on both sides equally. Um, so I don't know if you guys have found any or had any clients that have had, you know, these kinds of issues that neurologically the pathway somehow is, is not firing uh, properly and we're trying to create new neural pathways. So I don't know if anybody has an experience doing that or. Yeah. Do you guys want to give a little input either, Paul or Genevieve, or you, I'm happy to too. Just fine. I'm just listening for a moment. I'd like to listen okay, to your no experts problem. talk. No problem. I do, I, do have so, an opinion, I do have an opinion, but I'll share it in a moment. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. So she's, let me just ask a few questions. Sure. She's, um, so the neurological, so she has nerve damage in from that lumbar sacral plus plexus is what I'm assuming. Yeah. So she doesn't have full activity, uh, nerve activity down the right side or down both sides. Would I would say it's down both sides, but it seems to be more on her right. Okay. And the dorsiflexion of the foot is because the ankle is fused or because she doesn't have neurological it's uh, drop foot or... Yeah, it was drop foot, so it's fused. So oh, okay. Um, you know. They fused it so she could walk. Is that what, what the... Yeah, okay. and she wears um, orthotics to help okay. walk. Um, and, Does and she wear an AFO? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, she no longer uses uh, crutches. She actually just had a breast reduction, which was huge for her because she was very, very top head heavy and she's tiny from the waist down. So I had always told her, look, I think if you, cause she was really large at top and I always told her, if you pare this down, you're probably gonna walk better. Since she had the surgery, she doesn't have to use her canes or any devices anymore. So that's good. But um, yeah, it seems back to the neurology side, it seems like right-sided is mostly the issue. Yeah, and when you try to, what are some things you've tried to get her to align over the right side? So sometimes I'll have her do things like, um, I'll have her do some like eye drills. Um, so I'll have her flip her eyes up and down, up and down to gain a little bit more stability in her spine and in her extensors. Um, I'll also have her when she's going, like when she moves to the right, if she's really, really tight and not a lot of range of motion on the right, I'll have her stick her tongue in her right cheek. And then she's usually able to go further. But that kind of, that's, that's about all the tricks I've been able to pull out for her at this point. And what happens if you put her in that, like, um, have you tried things like standing leg lowers or what happens if you put her on the chair and you take the bar out and you have her pressing down? Can she find a way to have both legs working or? She can, she can. Um, it's, it's a little bit off, it's not perfect, but she's definitely getting better at pressing more evenly um, when we take that bar out. Um, I haven't, I think on the right side, she jolts the bar up and down a little bit more. So I think it's just that harder connection for her on that right side. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the way that I like to try and work is to almost put them in positions where they have no choice. The body has no choice but to work that side. And I think you're right. I don't think you have to always work both sides equally if both sides are not the same, right? Right. Um, the goal is that ideal alignment. So if it takes doing a little bit more or cueing differently or lifting up more on one side mm -hmm. is to try to try and get that alignment, then that's 
I think, a good thing, actually. Right. And encouraging someone to get on. So one of my favorites for aligning the body over one side is that standing leg lowers on the chair with the, yeah, standing in front, one foot on the pedal. I use a lot of props, poles, or rollers um, to prop them to get them up over that side specifically. So sometimes I'll have them push down, sometimes I'll have them pull forward, sometimes we'll put the roller beside, have them press down the roller mm -hmm. on the side to help activate and align over that side and then have them just static. I do a lot of isometric static work to help align while the other side's doing something different. Yeah. Sometimes, so sort of, it's it's kind of, it's, and I use it sounds like you do too, but I use my hands a lot to almost hold them there, so they can get that sensation of being in that alignment over mm -hmm. the leg. So, and then sometimes I won't re when I go to the other side, there be a totally different set of cues. Oh yeah. Totally different set of hand holds. Totally different set of position. Even sometimes a little more rotation to one side, hip in differently. So. Um, those are things like things like that standing leg lower. Maybe you've tried. You sound like you've tried. Maybe things like side sleeper or side lying side lying press on the like reformer. Yeah, I like that idea. The side lying press. Mm -hmm. Because then you can really cue the one side. We also do it over the arc on the reformer sometimes, and that also can help um, activate or stretch one side. Like if her side gets really tight. Right. You could stretch the side body and get her out of the back uh -huh. and then really isolate the glute to try and get that glute to turn on. Okay. Oh, that's a good right. idea. So that would give her a lot of put, mm -hmm. proprioception. So, I mean, that, that would be, and then sometimes um, I'll do prone work on the Cadillac, mm -hmm. right? And instead of, like, think of a swan potentially on the Cadillac, instead of having the hands, if, if you go center and both sides, one side's work, not working and one side's lifting and one side's not, maybe mm -hmm. try scooching the hands a little bit to okay. encourage one side more to fire to get the other side on. Oh, you see what I mean? So it encourages the hands over a little, with a little rotation sometimes uh -huh. might help fire one side to just get it going. And then you can try and come back to neutral and have both sides firing. So I, I kind of cheat. I cheat and try and put them in positions where they have to be on that side. Where yeah. I'm, or even, even if I have to flip them there, but then they have to hold it so that we start a kind of a forced use or an assisted use of that side if right. I'm holding them there. So that they start to hopefully, I mean, the thing is if she, she was born this way and it's been chronic this long, I don't know if those neural pathways aren't there now. I don't know if they'll get there. So it may yeah. just be a matter of helping her align in order to strengthen. Yeah, um, I think that that's probably where we're probably going. Yes, go more. ahead, Paul, jump in. So um, if I might take a different tact. Yes. As she was, as she was formed this way, mm -hmm. um, embryo embryonically, mm -hmm. then she's not meant to be symmetrical. Stop right. trying to put her in neutral. Yep. Okay. She's meant to have asymmetry, and her body has found its own constraints to move mm -hmm. efficiently. Right. So instead of trying to devise a program to reinforce a, a shape you would like her to alter to, right. enhance the sim enhance the efficiency, her body is creating itself. Uh -huh. What what often happens in embryology, and why these disform uh, uh, neurologically, why they they form poorly. It can be down to many, 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 many factors, as we well know, and often, often it's nutrition mm -hmm. or other genetic factors. There's many reasons sure. this happens, but it's happened. Right. And what we have to understand is what forces are inside the body that, that can we influence. Now, yes, alignment's a nice tool, but it, we tend to get blinded by trying to ma manage a neutral in our world mm -hmm. and try to find symmetry in a body that there, there isn't. She is so, symmetrical yeah. for so herself. Never, yeah, she's as symmetrical as she's going to get. Well, she never. we're not meant to be symmetrical. That's the whole right. point. The fact that we're imperfectly perfect what is what right. makes us so perfect, right? Exactly. So as humans, the fact that we're all different is because we're not symmetrical. We're not robots. And that's right. why you, I want, if you can, take off your biomechanical classical learning 
mm-hmm. and put on your bout and several understanding of living forces in the body. Yep. And if you can go down that route, it will give you way more options. So yeah. instead of thinking mechanically, how do I align her? How do I position her? How do I ask her to move? Mm-hmm. Ask what forces am I asking her to tolerate and recruit? Ah. So the, the forces inside the body, the, right. the living forces in the world and the universe are compression and tension. Right. And there must be a balance of compression and tension to have equilibrium, and we call it yeah. structural integrity. Mm-hmm. So if we don't create efficiency in that f- frame then and we don't create the, c- the correct constraints then the body will do it itself it has to because it's a self-defense mechanism it will right. survive regardless it's, well exactly and then unfortunately some of those strategies the body comes up with itself are not efficient and that's right. why you end up with dysfunction and, and but we can be part of that dysfunction if we try to if we try to dictate constraints so that makes sense. Look, look for where you can apply compressive forces that allow the torso, allow the structure at that neurological level to respond appropriately. So I use flexi bands all the time. I pull flexi bands from angles. and Because remember, nothing in the body is straight. There's not one piece of straight right. tissue in the body. There is no right. linear movement inside our human form. Everything is round. Everything is spiraling. So apply those forces. Less predictable. Make it work unpredictably. You'll be amazed at how they respond. That is one of the one of the really awesome things I learned about the pelvis uh, from a um, Dr. Niall Galloway, who's a pelvic surgeon and a bladder surgeon in the states. Mm-hmm. <coughs> he wrote a book, Finding Symmetry. It's really cool. But I, I've worked with him quite closely a few times uh, on my pelvic floor clients that have uh, incontinence and all oh, manner of God. damage, pre and post labor mainly, and nutritional issues. Mm-hmm. And we, we always focus on the ankle to influence yeah. the pelvis because the ankle grows yep. grow first. Yep. And if you can, if we influence, they're, they're basically mirrors of each other. Yep. So that can really be very informative for you. It, whatever's happening at the ankle is directly related to that's what's happening true. in that particular pelvis. So that's, that's, a, that's a gift for us because we mm-hmm. don't have surgical opportunities to get inside, but right. we get a mirror to the inside because we can see right. what the ankle is doing. We get a visual representation. So it allows us to be subtle. Yeah, that makes, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. And then start thinking about the viscera. Viscera requires room to maneuver. Yep. So your breath is your key friend. Yes. And how you go about your breathing is your key friend. So don't, tar- don't forget targeting the pelvis. If you, fo- yeah, if you get I that, if you get a thoracic to move. With her. I Sorry? spent a lot of time on, on pelvic floor work with her. But don't. Why, why it's, it's ineffective if you focus on on pelvic floor it, it is ineffective you must focus on structural integrity of the form that creates the pelvic floor not the pelvic floor itself so it's in it, your body at a cellular so level the ankle, cha- is that what you're saying on the ankle things of that no. nature? what i'm suggesting is is that you pay attention to the environment you're asking to improve so if you want to improve pelvic floor back off from the pelvic floor, focus on the internal viscera of the liver and the kidney and the lungs and get them moving properly. And they'll, appra- they'll create the right internal pressure to okay. make the pelvic floor respond. Okay. But if it can only respond, it can only respond if there's enough dynamic tensioning sure. of the pelvic floor tissue, which is 75% fascia. Right. So it doesn't respond like muscle, as you know. It responds right. like a trampoline. It's right. more bouncy. But if, if you think of a trampoline, then a trampoline, the material must be connected to the frame Correct. to have tension within it. Right. Well, the pelvic frame is the femur. Yeah. OK. And if you don't focus on the correct rotational forces of the femur, right. then you don't get the tensioning forces within the pelvic girdle. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Well, it's well, it's true. So, <laughs> so if you can promote bounce. And you can promote torsioning effects properly in these spiraling rotations of the femur. Right. And remember, you must have counter rotations. Because right. remember, there's no bending action of the knee. The knee does not bend. Right. It's a counter rotation of tibia and femur. Okay. And once those rotational forces are applied properly, then you get tensioning network, net, networks of the, of the viscera and the pelvic viscera in particular. In coordination with, of course, 
thoracic and cervical rotation that must counter rotate. Oh, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. But uh, it's you. where I've had my greatest success with pelvic issues and deformities, whether it was born from a cerebral palsy. I have a few of those right. clients. I work with a guy named Leonard Bloom, who's a, a cerebral palsy specialist. If you want to look Leonard Bloom up, he's a genius. I get lots of uh, advice of him and his team. Um, Dr. Nal Galloway is, again, the surgeon I ref refer to. He will, get, he will help with all your pelvic floor issues and bladder issues. He's a, he, does post, he does rescue surgery for uh -huh. surgery that has been done poorly in the States. Ah. Yeah, that's his main job. He's, he's a rescue surgeon now. He goes in and undoes the damage that's been done by poor biomechanical surgery oh, and, and goes in and does biotensegral surgery. There's a lot of them out there. Oh, this, listen, there's endless cases. He's a very busy man. And, and not, not a happy busy man because he understands the classical training has created most of these problems. We know right. biomechanics ultimately creates most of the problems that society is uh, you know, experiencing True. because it's how we train, live, teach, rehabilitate. It's, it's right. a disaster. So we're trying to change that and we're trying yeah. to re-educate the globe with understanding the forces of biotensegrity and the new concept and this 21st century understanding of anatomy and physiology so we're better f informed so right. we can inform people better and they can make better choices and if they choose to move in biomechanical ways that's their choice once we explain to them the consequences right. and that we we're here to help manage them later no thank you that's that's, that's very helpful you're welcome uh, someone who has been teaching Pilates for 25 years, this concept of biotensegrity and working in that, that kind of way of working with the body is fairly new to us. Um, well, for somebody, I'm teaching Pilates 20 years, sir, and I great. only know it. And, I, and I, I've argued with my own brand about, they call it the biomechanical principles. And I say, how can it be? Because we're not a machine. Yeah, I'm, I agree. We're not a machine. I don't teach like the body's a machine. I don't actually talk too much about muscles and Good. bones. I, I work from a completely somatic point of yes. view. And I work from uh, with, I start with the breath. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I work with people, I, I have clients uh, who've come to me who have such severe spinal problems that they can't lift their head up. Mm -hmm. They can't stand up. Um, yep. And it's very, very challenging. You're right. You have to throw out all of the ideas of what you want to do with alignment, what you think is perfect alignment, right. and work with the body that you have. And the way I work with the body that I have, I can't, I don't really understand all the little uh, words and terms that you use for it. But in terms of trying to find what the person does efficiently, one mm -hmm. of the ways that I find I can find that out is by having them breathe and seeing the way their bodies move and react to when they're breathing. And when they start to do isolated movements, what does that do? Do, do they stop their breathing? Does it enhance their breathing? For sure. And, and look at, and look at the, the way they're able, can they create separation also between one body part from another body part? So I don't know. If why that would, why would you want them to do that, sir? Right, what's it, uh, Jonathan? Why, why would you want them to separate body parts? Um, so what I mean by separate body parts is whether they can isolate one body why part. Why would you want them to? Because so they can gain control over their body. But they can't gain control in isolation. It's a global unit. I it's understand one system. isolation is a concept and that there's no such thing as one thing being separated from another. I totally understand that, but I'll tell you the way, what I've learned in terms yep. of skill, awareness, training, which is what I considered Pilates to be. Yep. It's a skill-based awareness, awareness training system and all, all arts, all disciplines, everything from playing the piano to learning a foreign language begins with learning how to isolate and articulate. If you can't articulate a U sound in French, you can't speak French. If you can't articulate your little finger on the piano, you're gonna be limited. So if you can't articulate your wrist, if you can't articulate your shoulders, if you can't articulate your head, you're gonna be limited in the control you have over your body. 
whether you feel this is a skill that's valuable to people or not is that's up to debate. I don't know. Maybe it's worthless, but I, think- I agree. No, I think I think I think controls. I mean, the, the crown jewel of human anatomy. Well, that's not true. Anatomy is dead things. The crown jewel in human physiology is 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 super stability. We know that stability is the key stabilization and, and appropriate constraints. But I, I, I'm not a, I'm personally not a fan of isolating things. I want them to have structural integration. So you say they want to have articulation of the wrist and the finger and the shoulder and the neck, but without understanding the relationships of all, they won't get quality of that. Well, or you won't be able to identify why there is a limitation within a certain articulation. And as and you're absolutely right, as a as an educator, and because we're educating people who don't understand physiology as well as perhaps we think we have a clear understanding. We have to be careful how much information we impart and how much challenge we give them. But Absolutely. I personally, and I think you're right to start with breath, but first I show them the picture of the jigsaw we're trying to go for, not, but make sure they see it, that they, they understand that everything is directly related. For instance, the shoulder issue. If, you're, if people are treating any sort of discomfort or, 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 or pathology that is not that they don't remember the actual time he got hurt, then X does not mark the spot and they're in the wrong position. Uh, we know this. Like if you've got a shoulder injury and it's on the right side, it's invariably your liver. That's the problem. This is true. This is 99% of global cases of shoulder issues. It's your liver. <laughs> well, why did nobody tell me that? I but if you isolate the shoulder and you try to improve movement of the shoulder because they have shoulder issues, you my go in a massive and circle. My both hurt, by the way. They both hurt. Sorry, sir? <laughs> I think I've overused my liver a lot in my life. Well, don't no, yes. Hey, listen, don't we all? I've got a wine cupboard full of liver issues. <laughs> but it's the fact of the matter is that I, I, I'm, I personally, I, I like, I like, I want them to be whole and move wholly. No, I and, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I won't. I didn't want to describe to you my whole teaching methodology, but it begins with awareness. It progresses to being able to articulate, then being mm -hmm. able to isolate, then being able to coordinate, then being able to integrate, yeah. and then the whole body awareness. So the process, it has to do with the steps along the way. Giving a person an idea that, okay, I want you to be aware of your entire body all the time. Now let's start doing this. I don't think that they can really handle that right away. So most of what I'm teaching <laughs> is to teach them to be aware of, can you move one thing and not have it pull you another way or is, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, of beginning with a person, like you said, and not giving them something that they don't understand when they're not ready for it. But I totally agree. Well, that but, whole body. And yeah, it's finding out what they're ready for and understanding the concepts that they, if, if, firstly, we have to make sure people understand they must unlearn what they think they know so that they're ready to learn the new skill you're offering them. Correct. Yeah. Like you can't go in one direction and not have a response. The body is an anti-stretching structure. It's meant to oppose movement. That's the why yeah, I, your I body responds the way it does, right? I teach two directional action all the time. I've been teaching forever. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of time, a lot oh, of I don't, that I, I don't doubt it. One second, sir. I don't I doubt totally, it. One I totally teach. It's when thing goes one way, there's an oppositional force going the other way and, and the awareness of gravity and all For of that. Sure. But, the most, most of the thing I think that we're, I, unfortunately I have a client at 430, but most of the thing that I'm aware of is we want, all of us hopefully want to help. And whatever way we can, whether that be pulling from the classical repertoire, whether it be pulling from some other teacher that you studied with in Thailand, wherever you do, or just pulling from your own creativity with that one person and what that person is making you decide at that moment, so long as your intention is to make, to try to help that person to move more efficiently, hopefully we will, you know, be able to help them. And that's, I guess, do, the best we can do. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to leave. I have a 430 appointment. Thank you, I love this. I'm really glad I got invited. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> So, Paul, can I ask you a question? Yes. Could, could you give an example of how, or like a simple example of somebody, how, what would your, what would your first take, intake look like with somebody? 
So well, the first thing what, that I do. Yeah, or maybe give an example, like a more specific, just so that we have an idea more specifically of what you would do with somebody. So, uh, my back, let me tell you my background, then you might have an idea. So I'm firstly a neuromuscular therapist, which is basically a, a fancy masseuse. And I spent many years, five years, learning about trigger point therapy and understanding why trigger points are formed and their common patterns of referral. So that gave me a nice map of why people end up in discomfort. And X never matched the spot, but it was a good, it gave me a good opportunity to go ahead of the game. Because so, I would know where to go looking other than where traditional people would look. And in conjunction with that, I got asked to do Pilates a long time ago now with the stop run. And they decided that uh, I was good enough to become one of their tutors. And they both tandemed. And I found that the Pilates I was doing and applying, my, 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 my background, by the way, is martial arts. I've been doing martial arts since I was seven and 50. So I, I understand what Jonathan was saying about systems and having skill sets and going through protocols. So I'm quite methodical in my process. So I like to see how people learn. And why they learn a certain way. So I have these two. I have the way of looking at the human anatomy and I have my hands on them. And I do cadaver studies every year. So I go inside and I check out what's under the skin so I can anticipate what's likely there. I understand what what depth I'm touching. I, and I spend a lot of time analyzing palpation. So I know if it's useful or, or, or counterproductive. And then I, uh, of course, now I understand how to teach people to cue them, to show them sequencing, to show them timing and to show them efficiency and to show them relationships of exercise physiology. But people don't know this. And I'm battling often in re-educating their, their current understanding of how they should move and what they currently do because of how they're traditionally taught and what their past experiences are for most people. And as we know, most people would kill themselves before they do anything preventative. They, would, they will always be a reactive <laughs> response and this is just the reality so i spent most of my year globally instructing people on biotensegrity and fascia in movement and as a preventive measure to the students and to um instructors around the world so that we can anticipate our clients mentalness and their approaches to movement so we're already ahead of them and we're expecting what's coming through the door so and, and having a clearer understanding of physiology in a more current understanding of what we know, is what opens your eyes and makes you identify things much clearer and explain it better with a better vocabulary that makes sense to the general public. I'm not a scientist. I don't have one degree, but I hang around with very clever professors so that I can be their bridge from their research. So I, if I can understand it and I can explain it to my students and my clients, then the, then the science is worth it. Does that make sense? So that's the position I find myself in. I'm the bridge as an educator. And then where I get the beauty of it is I get to use it on my clientele. And what that means is when somebody walks in, I can already, I can often already tell what they've come for before I see them, before they open their mouth. Because I can tell how they're walking. I can tell how they posture themselves. I can tell how they uh, address me. I can tell by the look on their face. I can generally, I can, I can anticipate it now often, but I try not to assume anything. I try to wait until they've told me and listen to what they've said. And when they tell me what they think they're saying, I'll then often just repeat it straight back to them. So I, I, they hear exactly how they describe their position and circumstances. Ooh. And then I'll say, did I get that right? Not my interpretation. What did they say? And often clients are surprised that they were heard. And then what they do, they go, no, that's not what I meant. I go, oh, okay. So now they realize that somebody's listening so they get to choose more appropriate words that really describe their true sensation or true inhibition or true problem that they're coming to with or their true reason they want you to, to explore time with you. And then I repeat it again. Did I get it right this time? And they go, yeah, you did. So, okay, good. So now I understand what you're really here for. Now I can give you my opinion and we can get going. And once I get going, I, I instantly start doing movement. Or oh, straight away, I get them moving. I want to see how they move, but without them being consciously aware of controlling it. So I do a lot of eyes closed exercises. I, I want them to take away the ability to control it with their sight. Because mm -hmm. I want to see how they have, they have created themselves and how their neurological system is managing it. Yeah. And once I get that, that real perspective... Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
No, I just so once I get that real perspective and I tape it on their phone, I so they see it. So it's not my I get I want them to see what I see. Right. And then I, I show them, listen, this is what you're currently doing. You're currently favoring this. You have lost your counter rotational properties. You're not structurally integrated. You are biased or inhibited. And let's start talking about now how we change those 